Good morning, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into Your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very grateful for the opportunity that You continue to give us to feast upon Your Word together. We understand completely our limitations and how exhaustive Your Word is. I just ask that You would comfort us, guide us, filter out that which is foolish and ignorant, but seal to our hearts the truth that You would have us, each and every one of us, know. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. In our Sunday morning services, we are studying together the second epistle of Corinthians verse by verse. And in our last study, we were at verse 11, chapter 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. And we briefly touched on Satan's devices. He's a liar, and he's uh, the father of lies. He's the deceiver. In fact, a deceiver is his main name. And the process of Satan is to deceive men with respect to the truth of God's Word. So we continue then at verse 12. I'm going to try, at least try in this video to make some effort to follow along in the Greek. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord, a door had been opened permanently unto me of the Lord, is what the text is saying. I, I want you to see in this verse that the Holy Spirit is, is making it crystal clear that, that it is the Holy Spirit who works in the life of Paul. You know, we could spend a lot of time arguing that Paul had laid the plans and worked out all the logistics of his campaign, and uh, and he was about to, uh, you know, establish an evangelistic uh, effort in Troas. But the Holy Spirit is directing our attention here to the fact that He is the one that led Paul to Troas. You know, it doesn't take much Bible study to realize that. Uh, that Paul and Titus had made an agreement that Titus would go to Corinth, examine the situation there, see, see what it was like, report back to Paul, obviously deciding to meet in Troas. You know, if we were to look at the human logistics of it all, uh, you know, Paul and, and Titus had, had prearranged a meeting in Troas so that that Paul, uh, continuing his work in the ministry of the gospel, uh, might know the situation at Corinth when he got to Troas. He was obviously there because of the leading of the Holy Spirit. You know, for a door was opened, but we read on in verse 13 that he didn't have any rest. Now, I don't want to go into the 13th verse yet without really looking, first of all, at the, at the 12th verse. I think we need to look at it really carefully so that our lives and our ministry might be, might be conducted according to the truth of God's Word. You know, because if we begin to doubt in, in the least that this is the Word of God, and that's a, more prevalent today than you might think, uh, that, it, that it's in, in fact the product of, of human intelligence, we've taken away the mainstay of Christianity, which is faith. If this is not God's Word, folks, uh, if, if it's not absolutely reliable uh, and plenarily and verbally inspired and we don't have God's Word, we might as well just become some, some social group uh, on Facebook, some... some a group of people gathering together to discuss uh, one another's evils 
and it wouldn't take much discussion to find out that you're as bad as I am, and, and well, that, that would, that would uh, that'd give me a lot of peace. It wouldn't give me any victory in the things of the Lord, but, but it would be most satisfying for me to find out that you're as bad as I am. And I'm sure to some of you, it'd be greatly gratifying to find out that I'm as bad as you are. You know, and so we could have a social group or we could have a YouTube channel that, you know, where that all, all that we discuss is, is that which is really just vain in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, vain meaning that it's temporal. You know, there, there's no value in eternal truth. It has no value in our learning, uh, growing in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's only a fantasy. It'll, it'll help us over the rough spots, you know, in our human walk. You know, it's, it's something that, in, in it, that it ends entirely when this life ends, and, and that's what he says in Colossians. Uh, uh, we went through that book verse by verse. You know, if, if uh, since, first class condition, you died with Christ from the elements of the world system, why are you living in it? Why are you subject to those ordinances? Taste not, touch not, handle not. Uh, all of these which perish with the using. You know, when you're dead, they're dead. And uh, God's giving us a, a revelation that is... Uh, only incidental in our, our walk here be below, uh, but is, is fantastic as we realize that, 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 that what that walk is in the light of God's eternal uh, purpose. Now, it's the Holy Spirit that laid out these plans. Uh, I mean, for sure, Paul and Titus had worked out those plans, but uh, folks, it's the Holy Spirit that led them. And when he got to Troas, he was there in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The authorized version wants, uh, wants you to make sure that you understand that Paul had decided to go there to do something. Uh, he went to Troas to preach Christ's gospel. Uh, and he says, And when I was there, a door was opened unto me. Now that's a perfect tense in the Greek. Perfect tense. You know, there, there's all kinds of discussions concerning the seven churches in the book of Revelation. You know, at least in at least one aspect of the consideration of the seven churches uh, to which the seven letters are addressed is that they represent various uh, facets of the church at, at any particular period in church history. And, and the one area where we look at the true bride of Christ is the church at Philadelphia. And to the church uh, of Philadelphia, he says, I am the Lord who opens a door that nobody can shut. And I am the one who shuts a door that no man can open. Now, I don't know how many times in my life as a, as a Bible teacher, I've heard Bible teachers point out that the doors are closing here and there's a door, here's a door opening here and here's a door that's closing here and when that door's closed, then we'll have our last opportunity to do this or that or, or the other thing and, and somehow we are insidiously pulled away from the power of God to the power of man. I mean, surely this passage is going to tell us that here's Paul at Troas with a tremendous opportunity that he's going to turn his back on and leave. And that's just got to be terrible. You know, we're often led to believe that there was an opportunity to witness to somebody, you know, you missed it and, and, and uh, you know, they were run over by a, a stampede of cattle and went to hell. You know, they, they might have been able to go to heaven if you'd just spoken to them or, or, or we didn't give people an opportunity to accept Christ and a family of three were killed in a car wreck and on the way home from church and, and went to everlasting hell because we failed to give them an opportunity to come to Christ 
And that guilt complex is built up in Christian after Christian. First of all, I want you to notice that this, folks, is a perfect tense, okay? If the door is open, it's not going to be shut because Paul leaves Troas. You know, I, I'll admit that I often tend to read the white spaces, but I'm going to suggest Paul probably came back. I don't know whether he did or not, but I'm telling you there's, there is no concern on the part of the Holy Spirit even if Paul willfully turned his back on Troas, that doesn't shut the door. No man can shut it by any action, and yet we are besieged with a human reasoning that says, that, well, you can shut the door and you can open the door. You know, I, I sat on the bus for three days with this guy, and I, I really didn't take the time to talk to him about the Lord and, I'm, uh, and so I'm, I'm guilty for the rest of my life. Folks, if God opened the door, no man's going to shut it. And if God did not open the door, no man's going to open it. Not by deceit, not by conniving. No way is man going to open that door unless God opens that door. And no way is man going to shut that door unless God shuts that door. So the, the verse, first of all, tells me that Paul is there in the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's there because God put him there. And there is a door opened unto me of the Lord. And the perfect tense says that the door was opened in past time with the consummate result that it remains open forever. Eternally. was opened unto Paul. It's because of the unto me there that I would suggest in, in reading the white spaces that probably though I have no evidence of that, probably after Paul met Titus in Macedonia, which we'll see, we'll, we'll, we'll read that in the seventh chapter, because from the 14th verse on, uh, from the 14th verse of the 2nd chapter to the 5th verse of the 7th chapter, we have Paul uh, rejoicing over the message that he received from Titus when he met him in Macedonia. You know, it just seems like he is exploding in praise to the Lord for the news that he received from about Corinth. Now, it wouldn't surprise me that, that maybe while Titus was pouring out all this wonderful news, they went back to Troas to operate in this open door. I don't know. Uh, the text doesn't tell me, but and since the Holy Spirit doesn't tell me, uh, I'm not sure I have any right to surmise. What is, what is crystal clear, as I look at the passage, is that God had placed Paul in Troas, and God had opened a door that Paul isn't going to shut. And, no, and nobody else is going to shut. And we know from the book of Acts that there was a result in Troas. You know, whether Paul did it or not doesn't matter to me. God opened the door and nobody shut it. And, and that is so different from the subjective attitude that, that seems to be prevalent in Christianity today that, that you create the opportunities and you capitalize on them. And if you don't, somebody's eternal destiny is at stake. In other words, the, the eternal destiny of other, peop, other souls rests entirely in your hands. And, and if you're obedient and you're yielded and you're surrendered, there'll, there'll be more people in heaven than there would be if you're disobedient and you're, you're not yielded and, and so on and so forth. I've talked a lot about Bama. I, I, I do believe your reward has an effect on your eternal fellowship to some degree. I do know that the accounting uh, tribunal of the Lord Jesus Christ was something that concerned Paul. And I think you'd be callous and you'd be foolish uh, in your approach you know, to the Word of God not to think about the day of accounting before the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm sure most Christians do not. I guarantee you, it, it, it does not matter how young or how old you are, you will give an account of your time, your actions, 
before Jesus Christ. I don't think the actions will be sin in your lives. I don't think He's going to show some rotten, filthy movie of your life. I think there'll be actions based on the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and great numbers of you, you folks will probably you know, go into heaven saved or redeemed, uh, delivered, whatever word you want to use you know, by the skin of your teeth. If any man's work shall suffer loss, he shall suffer loss, yet he himself shall be delivered so as by fire. And I, and I praise God for that evidence of God's grace. But that isn't the way that I really want to spend eternity. But it's it's not the it's not the subject of the day of accounting that has anything to do with the eternal destiny of another. You know, you're asking me to believe that in the last analysis that a sovereign God has a body of Christ, some of whom will be in glory and some of whom will be in hell because somebody failed to do something that God wanted them to do. You know, and rather than winding up with, a, with an all-powerful God, a sovereign God, a one, one who spoke the worlds into existence, the one who hung the stars in the heavens, we wind up with a helpless God whose entire program of the ages depends upon the yieldness and the obedience of, of individual people. And I, folks, I believe that is contrary to scriptural truth. When he was in Troas and he knew the door was opened unto him, there's surely the clear indication that he knew it was open and it wasn't going to be shut because he left Troas. The text says he had no rest in his spirit. Now, you know, the easiest thing for me to do is just to suggest to you that Paul wasn't trusting the Lord. He, was, he wasn't yielded to the Lord. You know, so what we really mean you know, is he had no rest in his flesh. But that isn't what the Holy Spirit says. I believe it's a God-given unrest. You've heard me talk a lot about rest. Hebrews, we labor to enter into his rest. That's his rest. But this is a specific rest in which, uh, or unrest. And I believe it is a God-given unrest. And, and that it's a clear indication on the pages of Scripture that the Holy Spirit wants Paul more concerned about the body of Christ in Corinth than he does about a new evangelistic effort in Troas. I have said for 40 years, almost going on 40 years, how that I believe that the, the, body of, the main primary, primary function of the body of Christ is the primary ministry of the body of Christ of Christ is first and foremost to itself, to where it builds itself up to go out and reach the lost. You know, Troas was not the primary concern. The primary push in Christianity today, today is, is a crisis Christianity. It's, you know, if we can just get them to accept Christ, we'll worry about the growth later on and we cite the Great Commission while turning our backs on John 21, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. And so surely here's another indicator of the Holy Spirit that Paul's first concern should be, actually was, the well-being of the body of Christ. And I read that as we have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially those who are of the household of the faith. I had no rest in my spirit. I don't, I don't think that's an indication of a lack of trust on the part of Paul, but an indication of the leading of the Holy Spirit. You know, probably the most common expression or, or one of the most common expressions that we hear in evangelical Christianity today is the Lord led me uh, to do he led me to start this. The Lord led me to do this. The Lord led me to do that. God spoke to me about this. And I think it's a phrase that we, we use all too loosely. You know, I wonder, I wonder how He led, led you. I mean, did He put a ring in your nose? Did He, you know, did He appear by your bedside? You know, did He, 
uh, folks, I absolutely knew that the Lord led me to preach this sermon this morning. Uh, why? Because I'm here. <laughs> but, but I didn't know that until just a few minutes ago. I, you know, if I'd gotten sick, I think God would have directed your attention somewhere else. You'd have had something better for you than this. And, and, uh, and then we'd have known that God really didn't lead me to preach this morning. And I think the way I know that God has led me or spoken to me, folks, is in this book. And I, ha I need to put my finger on it. Somehow I've got to put my finger on it. But I know He led me by looking backwards, not by looking forward. And it's an easy thing to let human relate, you know, this whole idea of, of human rationalization and de deduction and, you know, this human effort in, uh, uh, it just doesn't jive with that. You know, it's an easy thing to let, you know, human rationalizations substitute for the leading of the Holy Spirit. I believe this is the leading of the Holy Spirit. He had no rest in His Spirit because Titus wasn't there. If you're out there and you, you feel that restlessness because you don't have fellowship, you don't have a brother or a sister to fellowship with because they're not there, you might understand this and uh, and I've assumed from that that and, and I may be wrong you know you have to evaluate the passage the same as I do I assume from from that that he had prearranged with Titus to meet him there and now the Holy Spirit is saying Paul you shouldn't be in Troas Titus isn't here he has no rest in his spirit he's wrestling with the things of the Lord not his own fleshly desires and so he, he takes his leave of those at Troas and he went from there into Macedonia. And now we can really read, you know, the white spaces. Boy, that's, that's dangerous. You know, he takes, he takes flight 382 out of Troas and Titus has taken flight 391 out of Corinth to Macedonia and, and those guys are going to miss each other right in the air. You know, it was a dumb thing for Paul to do. He's going to go by ship, and Titus is going to come by land. Paul's going to go by land. Titus is going to come by camel. You know, I, you know, I don't know. And, and so we just start surmising. I don't think Paul's that dumb. You know, why can't, folks, why can't we give Paul the same intelligence that we'd give ourselves? You know, I told Titus to take the highway out to I-40 and then to take I-40 over to Oklahoma City and then Highway 112 down to Highway 60 and you know, duck down there near the Arkansas border, come down Highway 53 after he gets to Hartford. And, you know, so I know he's coming and he's driving. Boy, you can't believe it. You can't. He's driving an old Ford pickup and, and I know the color, so I'm going to blink my lights at him if I see him. And, and, you know, I think Paul and Titus had arranged this trip. I think it's, it's more like, you know, Titus, you know, what I want you to do is, is, I want you to do is go to Corinth. I want you to see the results of the letter. I want you to pray with them, see what the situation there is at Corinth. And then you're going to go here, 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 and here, and here. You're going to go through Oklahoma City. You're going to meet me at Troas. And, and he wasn't there, so Paul's going to retrace the journey. And I think those guys probably got as much sense as you have. So, and I don't see why I should sit here and surmise that this was a foolish thing to do. Obviously, the Lord didn't lead him to do it because they, they could miss each other. You know, when the obvious answer is they, they didn't miss each other. What he did was meet Titus in Macedonia, as we'll see in the seventh chapter. And so he, he left Troas where there was an open door, but there was no, no concern in either verse that the door is an opportunity that's missed. 
No concern whatsoever. It's a door that God opened. No man's going to shut it. Paul left. He went to Macedonia. And now, you, and now you see the great change in the book. The difference between verses 13 and 14 is dramatic. And, and unless you read to the seventh chapter and find out that he met Titus, it's puzzling to really sit around and, and, and look at the problem with verses 12 and 13. No rest in my spirit because I didn't find Titus. And then the 14th verse begins, uh, the, the greatest jubilation, folks, in both epistles. And it seems to, to pour out one verse after another clear into the seventh chapter. The seventh chapter. Now, now I can imagine, you know, such rejoicing if somebody had left them a million dollars to build a big radio station or, to, or some new website or YouTube channel or, or if the government had passed some kind of law that they could now work in, a, in an otherwise closed area or something like that. But all of this jubilation is because of the surrender and the yieldness of other Christians at Corinth. And I see that. I see your yieldness. I see your surrender. I see your repentance. What I see today really is more like Christian jealousy in the main. If you stand back and get the broad sort of picture of it all, it's... If the Spirit does begin to work in some area, we begin to say it's not the Spirit, it's more Christian jealousy than it is rejoicing over the fact that the Lord's doing something. And, and here I, I see five chapters of, of a, a Niagara Falls of rejoicing because, because hearts have been yielded to the Savior in Corinth. So for five chapters, I have immense rejoicing that my brethren in Christ have yielded themselves to the Lord. And dearly beloved, our lives are a missionary journey of sorts. You know, I was prepared for this in the first chapter because there, there it was revealed that my rejoicing is you and your rejoicing is me. And we make rejoicing material things. But the Holy Spirit doesn't. You would search long and hard to find one case of rejoicing for material things in the Word of God. You know, if I was to look at Christian praise today, well, what would it be? You know, it'd be, you know, for new clothes, a new house, new rug, new 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 equipment, new tools, new car, new job, a raise, a uh, pretty wife, obedient kids. Uh, and and fo Lord, folks, I, I thank God that they're praising Him for something. But if one was to filter out all the Christian praise today, it would look like the majority of Christian praise to God is based on materialism. You know, something God did that I can see materially. But the growth in another Christian's life, the difficulties through which I pass, that I learned something. You know, occasionally I see that. But I'm talking about the major portion of Christian praise to God seems to be more like what I'd say to a genie. You know, I... You know, you just rub the bottle just right, you know. Rub that genie's that lamp or whatever. Rub it just right. I, I rub it because I want something, and I get it, you know. Thank you, genie. And God is almost somebody that, you know, well, if I just stroke Him just right, I get anything I want. just depends on how, how you rub it, how you pet you know, if, if, if you can please Him, boy, I mean, you've got an all-powerful wizard. You know, you can do anything you want done, and we just explode in praise over that. Over this, that, and the other thing. But that's not the praise I see. 
in this book. Now, I'm tempted to say never. I, I, I'm going to say hardly ever do I see any praise for some material benefit in the Scriptures. And when I see spirit-gendered praise and prayer to God, it's always in the spiritual as though these things are incidental, and I believe they are. You know, Christianity, particular, uh, that particular Christianity that we often hear on this channel, we talk about the world religious system that's based on human merit, particularly modern Christianity, you know, has, has made evidence that people can see of supreme importance. You know, oh, if we could just get the star quarterback redeemed, think what a testimony that'd be to the, to the campus, you know. If we could just get the biggest businessman in the United States as a born-again Christian, well, you know, then we could get all those lesser dumb businessmen that, you know, who would be impressed by the super successful businessman and we want to willfully turn our backs on the fact that God says He doesn't call many wise, many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But no, no, we're going to go out and get them. We're going to go out and get them because God doesn't. And, you know, and somehow or other we seem to be warped into a, a, a Christianity that looks at visible evidences. You know, if we can't get it anyplace else, we'll get it in tongues and healings and ecstatic experiences, but, but boy, we won't get it in simple trust and praise toward God for the spiritual growth. You know, for the results that we see in our lives and in others. Now, thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph Thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph in the Christ. The Christ. Now, first of all, that's a present active participle, so the thing seems to be translated pretty good, but what does it mean? Does it mean that God always triumphs over me? Because that's really what the Greek looks like. I spent some time looking at this. The word's only used three times. Some say two. I... It was always used as somebody who won a victory over somebody else. You see it in Colossians where you're complete in Christ. You're complete in respect to sin. You're complete with respect to identification. You're complete with respect to resurrection uh, from the dead. And, and then it says that, that He took the laws, the ordinances which were contrary to, to us, took them out of the way, nailed them to His cross, the triumphing, triumphing uh, over them uh, in it. Who's the them? Well, it's obviously Satan and his hosts. And so here the Scriptures declare that Christ triumphed over Satan and all his hosts. That's the normal use of the word. Same word here. Okay. So it would look to me, if, if I were to be consistent in translating that word, it would be that God triumphed over me in Christ. And yet what I want to say is that God causes me to triumph over everything else in Christ and that I'm part of the victor's parade rather than the parade of those whom God has triumphed over. I, and I, Folks, I don't know the answer, really. To me, the common sense of the passage says that God's the victor. We are the victors with Him because of Christ. So we are the victors in this parade. The language, the grammar tells me that's not the case. God is the victor in this parade, and I'm one of those over whom He's victor. As I, as I follow the literal Greek, it would lead me to that conclusion. That, that is obviously not the conclusion that the translators of the authorized version reached. So I'm going to suggest it's both. I, I rarely do that. Uh, because, but I am, I'm going, to say, I'm going to say it's both, because of the words, in Christ, which was Paul's favorite phrase, by the way. Uh, he uses that phrase a lot. Uh, because Christ had victory over us, we now in Christ have victory. 
I think two major possibilities of that are, well, one is that you are the one over whom God had triumphed, uh, or you are with God in that triumph, and you're triumphing over the forces of evil. The former being, well, you were part of that evil he triumphed over. Okay. Those are the two major possibilities. There is a third now, uh, and that is that that doesn't apply to you at all. That applies only to preachers of the gospel, and folks, I don't like that possibility. I, I'm going to reject that outright. I think that's the normal approach taken by many Bible students who are gung-ho on being Bible teachers. Uh, folks, to some degree or another, you are a teacher. Okay? I realize God gave the gift of teaching and pastoring to certain people. I understand that. I recognize that. And I wouldn't argue with the Word of God on that. But to some degree or other, you are urged to preach the Word, to be in season uh, and out of season, to teach and exhort with all long suffering. And I don't think you can take that verse and limit it only to Bible teachers. Or, or some other class of, of special Christians. I believe the Word is for all of you and that we are said to be ambassadors for Christ. So to that degree, the verse surely applies to you. So I'm going to leave that possibility out. So the possibilities, as I see it, folks, are that God has, has triumphed over you. The other possibility is that you're in the group that triumphed and you're, you're leading captive the forces of evil. And I, I don't know. I'll just admit, I don't know. For, I can't say for sure what that is, but... But it does just seem to indicate both to me. Uh, is he triumphing over us and leading us as the victor, or is he leading us as victors? Uh, that's the big problem with the verb. Now, in the other two cases that that occurs in the New Testament, it is always God in triumph over somebody. This would be the one exception here. It, it just looks to me, in trying to follow the use of, of the Word outside of the Bible, I, can I, can't, I can't find any cases outside of the New Testament where it doesn't mean that when He leads me, I'm the one being led. Okay? And so it looks to me like here I'm under the triumphal banner of God Almighty in Christ. That's the way the verse looks to me. Uh, you could say we're trophies of Christ's victory. You could say that, I guess. I guess that's what I'm really kind of trying to allude to. It seems to me that what this passage is saying is that God is the victor, uh, and I can be submissive to that. In the extra-biblical use of, of, of the word, the spoils were put to death. Now, I believe we were. We are spoils, okay? But uh, we were put to death. But that doesn't bother me uh, at all, really, because I believe that that I did die with Christ and that I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. If you look at all the other ways it's used, the, the victor, the victor who was victor over those who were being led as the spoils, always at the end of the parade, he always put the spoils to death. And that's exactly what I think has happened, that I have died with Christ and I praise God that my old nature hasn't no part and parcel with the new creation. So that doesn't bother me, but it does bother a lot of the translators to say that it's, they say well, it's an inconsistent picture to see God leading us as the one who was victor and then putting us to death at the end of the parade. Yeah, I think we're put to death. Uh, the death sentence is, is on us throughout the parade. We call that our life, like life I guess. In Christ Jesus, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I'm told that I died with Christ. I was buried with Him. That I was raised with Him. So I, I don't think the picture is inconsistent. And, and maketh manifest the savor of His knowledge by us in every place. Uh, we'll read in the fourth chapter, if you went, if you went ahead to, to the fourth chapter, verse 11, For we who live... That is, those out of life toward life are constantly being handed over to death. There, well, there's your parade. Because of Jesus, the victor, 
so that the life of Jesus, that sweet fragrance, that sweet odor, may also be revealed in our mortal, mortal flesh. Not only is God the victor, but He sends us forth as a sweet-smelling fragrance, which is a manifestation of His knowledge. And the us is plural. Uh, all of us. Yet what I often hear today is something like, well, you know, that guy smells kind of good and that one's not so good, but that other guy, he just really stinks. I mean, he reeks. You know, it's like... Dearly beloved... You have the same sweet-smelling fragrance to God, to the Father, as did our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, all the foolish praise that, that, that Christians seem to heap on other Christians, I, I think many a man's been ruined by that because people have praised them rather than God. It's a devastating thing that, and it's very prevalent, prevalent in in uh, Christianity, God crushes us to send forth the savor of His knowledge by means of us in every place. Every place. Every place. Now, I'm told that, you know, by crushing us, God puts forth an odor in every place. And that's a present active indicative. Uh, we are unto God a sweet odor of Christ in them that are delivered and in them that perish, both. Them that are saved or delivered is a present passive, passive voice, folks. God zealously guards the evidence that it is He who's doing the delivering. It's He who's doing the redeeming. And I'm astounded at how prevalent uh, and important in modern day Christianity is this is the pagan thought that man's doing it. You know, if you'll just do something, if, you, if you'll just repent, believe, regret, be sorry, I don't know, you name it, but whatever's preached, normally it comes back to, you know, you've got to believe it. You know, if you don't believe it, you don't got it. And yet God zealously guards the fact that He's redeemed His own. My authorized version says, them that are saved as, as, the, as, as though that's a finished transaction in past time. The word saved, I've told you, I believe, is used prince, first and foremost, is used by the Holy Spirit of deliverance, not of redemption. There's a, an aspect of redemption that delivers you from hell, to be sure, but you'll search long, long and hard to find absolute passages that say that that's the only indication of the word. So that's why Christianity of a generation ago in wrestling with this, came up with the three tenses of salvation. You've probably heard them. You, you were saved. You are being saved. You shall be saved. To me, those are not the three tenses of regeneration. Those are the three tenses of, of experience. You are delivered. You are being delivered. You shall be delivered. But you are redeemed. You're a new creation in Christ. That is a finished transaction. Now, this is a passive, but so is perish. Okay? The, the Greek mind didn't allow you to perish yourself. Well, I, you know, you got suicide, of course, but that's not the idea in the word uh, apolomai, which is the Greek word there. So some say what that verse really says is that we are under the God, a sweet odor of Christ in them that are constantly being delivered and in them that are constantly killing themselves, active voice. And, and so I can pull out for you two or three commentaries that point out that the first of these verbs is passive and the second is active because God is doing the delivering, but man is doing the perishing. And I can't go along with that. That word apolomai is contrary to the thought of the active voice. No one perishes themselves. You know, I hear in Romans chapter 8 or, or 9, uh, what if God willing to show His mercy endured with much long suffering vessels of wrath prepared, prepared beforehand for destruction? That seems to indicate the passive voice. Maybe the Greek mind was, was right and not ever 
putting the verb in the active voice, I just don't believe any man is perishing himself. Uh, you go to heaven by God's grace, and you go to hell by your own will. That's, that's the common evangelistic preaching today. And I don't see that in this book. Why do you not hear my word or, or my speech? Because you cannot hear my words. The natural man cannot receive the Holy Spirit. The natural man can't receive the things of the Spirit for they, they are spiritually discerned. Uh, natural man can't see sinning and so on. I think it's just goofy, okay, to stand up and say that a man goes to hell by his own choice and, but he, and he goes to heaven by the grace of God. Whereas a much more logical approach to the Word of God is that Satan has a family that he sowed as tare, and God has a family that he sowed as wheat. The wheat's going to wind up in heaven, the tare's going to wind up in hell, and I see nothing wrong with a passive voice in both verbs. We are a sweet odor of Christ in them that are saved and in them, in them that perish. We're an odor of death unto death. In the Greek, it literally states uh, out of death unto death and or out of life unto life. Okay? I love that. We are an odor out of death toward death. And to the other, we're an odor out of life toward life. And the verse closes, who is sufficient for these things? And I, folks, I think the idea there in sufficient is who else could have done this but God? Of course, he's the victor. You, you couldn't have worked it out. You're not able. You are not able. You, you and yourself are not able. You are not able for the death toward death toward death or the life toward life. You're just not able. I think the sufficiency in the 16th verse looks back to the triumph of God in the 14th verse. And I think the expression is there to reveal to us that this is a God-ordained order and that the Holy Spirit is perfectly in control when Paul leaves Troas, some their uh, death unto death, some their life unto life, the Holy Spirit is in perfect control as Paul leaves Troas to meet with Titus and discuss together the situation that existed there at Corinth. And that brings us to the last verse, 17th verse. I don't think we have time to expound on that in this video. There's just a lot to cover. For we are not as many who corrupt the Word of God. First of all, the many is, is the word pale. We'll look at that next week. Uh, there's just a lot to say about the 17th verse. But the 17th verse says, basically in summary, that most Christians are hawking the Word of God. Terrible, terrible thought. Tremendous charge made by the Holy Spirit. Until next time, I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.